Hey everybody, it's Jason Blaha here, and once again, it is time for the Monday Q&As. So let's knock this out. First question. Which is the best ab exercise to increase core strength that can assist in both squats and deadlifts? Also, what are your thoughts on dragon flag ab exercises? Actually, now that you mention it, I like the dragon flag. If a person can do them, obviously they can be a bit of a hassle for people with really big muscular legs. But when it goes back to what's good for a squat and a deadlift, well, anything that you trains the core to have more static strength or power through a limited range of motion over a period of time, so you train it for strength, stamina, statically, is actually very, very good for squats and deadlifts. And the dragon flag fits the bill there. It is actually viable for that. It's quite a, quite a good exercise for that purpose. Now, in addition to that, what else would do that? Anything that, that replicates the same thing, weighted planks are very, very good. Weighted crunches done with a relatively short range of motion can achieve the same effect. I'm not always a big fan of really long range of motion crunching and sit-ups just because it's not necessarily going to carry over to a great deal to your squat and your deadlift because it's not necessarily training that static strength that you want. But any core exercise is a good exercise there. It's just that sometimes people do excessive amounts that aren't necessarily helping them, but any core, anything that makes your core stronger will help you with stability on the squat and the deadlift. In addition to doing things like your squats and deadlifts without a belt or doing rack lockouts with more than your one rep max on the squat will put a tremendous amount of load on your core and train your whole core and thoracic region for, for extra strength and stability and you could even do those with a belt and still get the same effect in all honesty i think those are high on the list also just for training your entire core and thoracic region to stay upright whether you use a belt or not for them it's a very good way to go so that's what I would generally recommend, anything like that. There's no right or wrong answer that there's different methods there. And as long as you're, you're training that strength, stamina, and static strength in your core, you're not doing it, it bad at all. It's always going to work. All right, next question. Chest flies, your opinion on them. Why do you never do them? Has this exercise any carryover to bench press strength, injury prevention? Is this exercise useless, et cetera, et cetera? I don't really do them because I don't feel like I need them. I don't feel like my chest itself is a weak link on my bench press. I'm not as worried about overall beautifully balanced aesthetics. It's just not important to me. If it was, I might do some extra chest flies. It's just not a priority in my life. It's not a priority in my training goals. I, I'm a strength athlete. I, I train for fitness, overall fitness, health, not aesthetics. And I train for athletic performance for my specific sport, which is powerlifting. Now, as far as why I don't recommend them or do I think they're a bad exercise, no, neither, neither one. For many people, I would recommend the flies. But my view of isolation exercises is about training economy. Not everyone has endless hours to spend in the gym. And not everyone wants to spend endless hours in the gym. So the issue is an issue of how much results and ideal results can that person get or how fast can they reach their goals with the amount of time that they have to spend in the gym or that they're willing to dedicate to it. And doing excessive isolation movements and isolating every single body part isn't necessarily beneficial there, even if your goals are balanced aesthetics. In fact, I would recommend that even for that goal, for the overwhelming majority of people who aren't going to step on a bodybuilding stage, Isolation movements need to be limited to whatever is lagging. So if you're doing tons and tons of pressing for your chest, whether it's bench presses, dumbbell benching of, of different angles or weighted dips or whatever you happen to do lots of, you should come in and isolate whatever is lagging. Whether it's your delts, your pecs, or your triceps, whatever is lagging the most out of all of those is what you need to come in and exercise with uh, an isolation movement. If your pecs are lagging, then by all means, throw some flies in. It will help. If your triceps are lagging, throw some tricep extensions in. But when people screw up there and they're wasting their time with their training economy, and I'm not saying it's right or wrong, it's just an issue of training economy and making the best use of your time. If they're isolating all three of those muscles, rather than just do more compound movements that can hit all three in one set, it's just not good training economy. It's not necessarily making the most efficient use of their time, which is the issue, which for some people is not an issue. And if it's not an issue for you and you like spending extra time in the gym and you don't have anything else to do with your time, 
then by all means do that. But that's going to change in your life eventually at some point. And when that does, you're going to need to be a, a little more economy minded with it. So it's not a right or wrong answer there. And it's certainly the chest flies might be useless for one person. They might be an amazing exercise for another, depending upon your individual muscle weaknesses and where you are in your development. So they're neither a good or a bad exercise. It's just looking at what's the right tool for the job right now. So you should look at all your exercises. Make your life easier. All right, next question. Can you elaborate on things to consider when one completely replaces bench pressing with overhead pressing? I hate benching, but happen to love overhead pressing. How would you program it? Would you use different variations of the overhead press? Thanks. Uh, now, for people who are doing this, this is usually for people who want some sport-specific training or they're looking for very highly functional patterns that are going to carry over into the real world, whether it's uh, sports or martial arts or, or something else. That's what they're looking at. They may not like the bench press because, to be quite frank, I wouldn't do the bench press or program it so much other than I'm a power lifter. I write programs for a lot of power lifters. I have to do it in my sport, so do they. And a lot of people who follow my programs are American football players, a very large number of them, high school level, some of them early university level. They get tested on the bench press. They have to do it over and over and over to get proficient at it because they will be tested on it. So we use it for that purpose. But if I didn't power lift anymore and I was just training for general training, I would do this myself. I would lean towards overhead pressing as a primary movement and then to finish up and develop my chest, I'd probably be doing weighted dips. But keep in mind, weighted dips are not safe for every person. I've covered that in the past. But I would do a lot of variations of the overhead press. If I cut the bench press out completely, I would probably definitely use at least three things. I would use strict press, I would use push presses, and I would use behind the neck presses. In addition to weighted dips to make sure that my chest got proper development and I trained that functional motor pattern associated with it. And it's a good closed chain exercise for that. So that's what I would do personally. All right, next question. What effects can a segmented sleeping pattern have on your lifting and gains? Uh, this is subject to a lot of debate because I don't know how much good data we have on this for actual sports performance, muscle gains, things like that. Now, it's fair to say that segmented sleep probably isn't going to negatively affect muscle gains, growth, recovery, things like that because that stuff isn't as dependent upon REM cycles as it is just downtime resting and, and regenerating and healing while you sleep because you get to a point as soon as you go into sleep, your body usually shuts off your voluntary movement. It makes your body lay relatively still. You move a little bit in the night, but it's not as much as you would think you do. Your brain actually paralyzes you for something like 90% of that time. So that's really what matters there. The, the thing is that segmented sleep can dramatically affect cognitive function, particularly memory can be very negatively affected because those deep REM cycles that you get from continuous long sleep is what helps or reorganize your memories and store your memories better and it helps you with, with memory retention and acquisition. So that's really what you lose the most from segmented sleep. I'm not aware of any real data showing that it's going to hurt your gains, but it, it's fair to say those other things are important too, that if you don't have a healthy mind and good memory and cognition, you're not doing yourself any favors in life in general, which may end up negatively affecting your lifting and gain. So segmented sleep isn't perfect, but it doesn't mean you shouldn't be taking naps. If you need extra naps to recover from training, by all means do them. You're still getting rest and, and that's gonna help with muscle recovery and growth. All right, next question. The TV show Dr. Oz has been proven false in terms of advice given, but are there any current airing television programs in the US or UK that provide honest factual ways of improving health, general fitness and strength? Also, you never really talk about it, but do you enjoy any television your shows yourself for learning or entertainment? You know, to be honest, I don't keep up with regular television. I use Google and other things and recommendations to find shows that I want and download them and watch them on your computers or watch them on the TVs after the fact. I happen to love a lot of shows like uh, True Blood, Game of Thrones. And then we've also been watching my wife and I, Grimm, Lost Girl, as they've come out. I watch, I happen to like South Park. My wife doesn't like it. So we watch various shows after the fact. I don't really watch them live, so I don't keep up with what's on TV, and I haven't done so since the late 1990s. I, I went home and threw my television out. I ended up getting another one later to play on like a PlayStation 1. 
but I threw my television out when I had a university professor who had a PhD in psychology explain to me and showed data research that chronic television watching live stream television actually lowered IQ and I didn't want anything to do with that <laughs> so I ended up I went home and threw my television out and I haven't really watched live television since the late 90s as a result of that I download things that I want to see and, and watch them after the fact and keep them on, on hard drives so I really couldn't tell you I don't keep up with that I don't know what's on popular television outside of good shows that are related to the the niches and genres that I personally enjoy i get a lot more internet stuff these days than I do television. And I see a lot of people doing that. I know other people who don't watch television anymore either. It's a matter of time, I think, before the internet just completely replaces live television. And so, no, I simply don't know of any fitness or health shows at all. I've never heard of any that seem to be good at all on television. So I have nothing to recommend there, bro. All right, next question. Hi, Jason. I watch you religiously. Why, thank you. And can I get an amen? And have grown to trust your advice as being sound. My question is, I will be turning 40 this year. Well, it's not that old. I am just turned 38. And I have started working on building muscle after losing 75 pounds of fat in 2013 to 2014. The goal now is to be lean and build an impressive physique. No competitions. How should a person my age approach this? The only thing you really need to worry about if turning 40 versus being down in your 20s, you're going to recover a little slower. You're going to make gains a little slower. So what you need to keep in mind with that, you're not going to handle cutting as well as younger guys do as far as your hormones bouncing back. So cutting is not going to be that good for you other than, like you said, you lost 75 pounds for being obese. Bulking isn't going to work as well because you're going to gain more fat and less muscle because you're going to gain a little slower due to your age. And you're going to be slightly more prone to injury. So what I'm going to recommend is that you don't bulk or cut. You use recomp methods at this point. It's going to be a little slower, but you're not going to have to deal with the, the negatives of either bulking or cutting at your age. Look at the long term so it doesn't matter as long as you're making good progress year after year. You'll, you'll keep doing better. And so at hopefully at 45, you're doing better than you are at 40. And also because you're training, you're not doing bulking and cutting phases. And also, you're not going to have to subject yourself to the higher risk of injury from cutting combined with being a little older. So I think it's good if you just focus on recomping and slow, steady gains. Pay close attention to your technique. Pay attention to connective tissue and joint soreness so that you know when to deload, so that you reduce your chances of injuries. And just it's think of it as a, a marathon, not a sprint. Slow and steady wins the race at this point. Just nice, slow, steady recomping. Just nice, gradual, slow progression on all of your big lifts. Gain muscle, lose fat year after year. And again, hope if you do it that way and you can stay injury-free, at 45, you'll probably be leaner and meaner than you are now at 40. And that's how I would approach it. And again, the focus should always be what's going to reduce my chances of injury at this point and setbacks because you will not bounce back from those setbacks the same way that a 20 or 25-year-old will anymore. You need to be very careful of those things. Doesn't mean you shouldn't train hard. You just need to be leery of them. All right, next question. How can I replace glute ham raises as if there ain't no GHR at my gym? Well, <laughs> if you don't have a glute ham raise, you can't really do them safely. I love the GHR. I personally don't have access to one at the moment. If I did, I would do them all the time. But for now, I just deadlift in place of it. Now, if you really need that extra hamstring development, Probably what I would recommend at this point is just additional things like Romanian deadlifts, stiff leg deadlifts. That should get the job done for you. Unless you really are a specialized athlete and you really need that GHR, like you're a field athlete that really needs that extra bicep femoris uh, stimulation to help stabilize the knee, to keep uh, reduce injuries on the playing field like a serious rugby player or something then you, you really shouldn't need a true replacement. Just build your hamstrings up with the other stuff. But if you're a field athlete who's going to take those side hits and things on the field, you probably should consider finding a way to get a GHR anyways, change gyms or something. But otherwise, Romanian deadlifts will get the job done. All right, next question. Hi, Jason. If a calorie deficit is the key factor in fat loss, there is no if. 
that is the only factor. That's the only real factor that matters significantly. Other stuff is all added together, less than 10% of your fat loss, every other factor combined. Why is it generally accepted that sedentary individuals should follow a lower carbohydrate diet than active individuals? Does it really matter if a sedentary individual follows a high carb diet provided he's eating at a deficit? Thanks. The latter, yeah, as long as he's eating at a deficit, it doesn't matter. The issue becomes, can he eat at a lower deficit on a high carbohydrate diet? People who are insulin resistant tend to get a lot hungrier from the carbohydrates they eat. So it's not about fat loss through a direct route. It's about controlling appetite and energy and mood. That's why they benefit from a slightly lower carbohydrate diet. It is specifically to help them keep their calories lower. Does that make sense? So it's a factor that you're using to control appetite so they can actually keep their calories lower because they will simply struggle oftentimes if they're sedentary, particularly insulin resistant at all, to maintain their calories low enough on a higher carbohydrate diet. But there can be a lot of other individual factors involved. We can't just say because a person is sedentary that they're automatically going to be highly insulin resistant and they can't do a high carb diet successfully. It's just that for a large chunk of the population, it can be very problematic unless they, they're eating exclusively very, very high fiber carbohydrates possibly. And completely unrefined stuff as much as possible. They might get away with it, but for the rest, uh, it can just be problematic. And that's generally why it's just an appetite control thing. All right, guys, that's really all I have to say on that today. I hope it has been informative. And I will talk to you guys next time in part two.